So demystify the zero client because we've had HP on earlier about talking about thin clients. Um, we've had folks talking about VDI and interesting VDI and desktop virtualization. Um, it's kind of makes your head spin a little bit. So just clarify. And the Citrix guy talked about specifically what zero client uh, means. What is it? What is it? I mean, what is, how does it differ from all these other thin clients? Well, sure. I mean, at, at the most fundamental level, it differs because it doesn't have a processor in it. Zero really means no processing occurring at the endpoint, none of any type. And people who were using things like thin clients or PCs to act as the endpoint for a desktop virtualization system are in fact giving themselves twice the work because they're not only going to be managing the desktop in the cloud or in the data center, they're also going to be managing a desktop at the endpoint of the, of the network. I know a fair amount about thin clients because prior to coming to Pano, I was the CEO of WISE. Uh, which I did for about four years. So I understand what thin clients are good for, and I understand what their limitations are. Got it. And sort of d made tell that us, decision. Tell us, tell us what, what are those limitations? What are they good for? What are they not good for? Well, they're great for terminal services. That's what they were built for. Yeah. And as we all know, terminal services is a fabulous application paradigm. Um, but in point of fact, it only addresses a certain percentage of the enterprise applications that people might want to use. So. It's terrific for that. The problem is, anytime you try to retrofit an architecture, especially a hardware architecture, to something new, you end up kind of trying to force the square peg in the round hole. And more or less, that's what example? all these guys do. Can you give do. an example of the square in the round hole, specifically? Like, what, what would be that? What retrofitting you're referring to? Well, sure. I mean, look, when you're doing uh, desktop virtualization, what you're in fact trying to do is move the desktop from the endpoint and put it in the network someplace, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're trying to manage it in the network, and you're trying to do that for all these good reasons that our friends at Citrix and everybody else talks about. You know, decreasing the amount of administration, improving security, yeah. and all these other things. But if while you're doing that, you're actually leaving a computer at the endpoint, you're not actually taking advantage of all of what desktop virtualization is gonna bring to bear. So you're taking something that was designed to run you know, part of an application or an application stub or management or something else, and you're trying to dumb it down. But at the end of the day, you can't dumb it down because it's got a processor, yeah, it runs it. a okay. protocol, it does yeah. all the other stuff that you really don't want to have happen in a, in a pure VDI implementation. So, this, so one of the other components, so it doesn't have a processor, it doesn't have storage, uh, what about a system bus? Right? Well, Talk about the, the system bus and, and, and how that changes. Sure, well, what we have in fact done at Pano is we've figured out how to stretch uh, the virtual machine sits system bus across the network. So in point of fact, if you think about a PC, what a PC is is a system bus that has a bunch of stuff hung off of it. There's processors, there's memory, there's I.O. devices, there's all this stuff. And, you know, that system bus has certain characteristics. But the way the processor communicates, for instance, with the, um, with the memory is not using any kind of display protocol. It uses a PCI protocol of some type, which is a very, very low level sort of way of communicating. What we have figured out how to do is effectively fool the virtual machine into believing that that pano is on its local system bus. Mm -hmm. And so it treats it exactly the same way. We don't need remote display protocols because we're not doing remote display. As far as the computer is concerned, it's local display. And so that gives us a ton of advantages, including any USB device you plug into a pano will operate just as if it were plugged into a local PC. We don't need to duplicate drivers. We don't need to run fancy protocols. Just we works. Don't need to do, yeah, it just works. So what's this cost? $389, and that's all in. That's all the software, everything you'll ever need. So there have been people that speculated that ultimately this becomes a, a, a bundled giveaway, like a lot of you know, telcos will bundle in you know, phones. Do you see that happening? Open sure. a bank account, get a panel. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the nice thing right, about that device banking. is it won't break. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, the point, one of the things that we're doing as a company is continually working to drive the cost of yep. these devices lower and lower. Because for VDI, ultimately to really take off, the endpoint has to be commoditized down to a price where it's really insignificant for someone to get into it. John, this is exciting for me personally. I love this area because it's, it's got a geek, gadgety feel to it. But more importantly, it, it takes our whole theme of we think that the word desktop's a horrible name because, you know, when you have this kind of innovation, you're going to get smaller, faster, cheaper devices. You're looking at, you know, wearable computers. You're looking at, you know, computers everywhere. 
mean, the whole Internet of Things kind of comes into play, not just from a sensor network standpoint. I mean, how do you see that whole trend? I mean, you're essentially talking about a connected device. It's not so much consumer electronics. It's essentially a computer. Correct. The way we talk about a pano is we call it actually a consumption point. It's where people consume computing that's actually going on somewhere else. And it's because of the fact that we have been able to take all of the expensive parts out of the endpoint that you're going to be able to see this driven down and you're going to be shifting what used to be the cost of the PC into the network. And that's going to allow the entire sort of, you know, the, the entire ecosystem to be delivered at a much lower price point. So, agree with you completely. I mean, the difference with this, and this is the, the thing people have a hard time sort of getting over, is it's not a computer. It, it is a like part. <laughs> it's a part of a computer. And the computer is actually the network yeah. plus the back end system. It acts like a computer, running. though. It, I mean, as it, far as the end user is concerned, yeah. he's logged into whatever it, he or she is used to logging into. But that device is simply the I.O. subsection. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of the card that we used to put in the old big so, IBM so you're, you're So, you, so from, from your conversation, obviously you're old school, you've seen the movies before, multiple generations of innovation. The iPad and the iPhone, now Android, has kind of given the consumer a taste of this user experience heroin, we call it. And, and it's, it's good. People want more this profound user experience, and it's becoming the preferred user experience. So here at Citrus, they're talking about the user experience, et cetera, et cetera. But this really kind of changes the game because what you're essentially doing is taking that phenomenon of the iPad, that which will accelerate the user adoption of more computing at the edge. Right. How do you see the future evolving? I mean, I mean, right now the Internet of Things has always been discussion around sensor networks. But if you can connect to a network in whatever form, how do you see that playing out? I mean, what's your vision of this edge uh, becoming more intelligent? I mean, mobility is obvious an example, but beyond mobility. Well, you see, interestingly, I don't think of the edge as ultimately becoming more intelligent. I think that what's going to happen to edge devices is that they're going to follow the same commoditization patterns that we've seen in the PC world. So over time, people are going to look for ways to make them cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And the truth is, they're eventually going to get to the point that we got to in the PC world, say, five or six years ago, where you realize that you were about as low as you could go, as long as you needed memory, a hard drive, uh, a processor, and a case. Yeah. Um, so edge devices yeah. ultimately will, be, will follow a paradigm similar to what we've been able to demonstrate with, with this edge uh, consumption point that we have. So what needs to happen is the networks need to continue to get more and more robust and the back-end systems continue to need to get more and more robust. That's happening as we speak. Yeah. There are whole parts of the world right now where you can go on wireless networks which are extremely robust, have low latency, have extremely high bandwidth, etc. And that is what we're going to see proliferated everywhere and when that happens you're not going to have the need to have all of this processing packed into an edge device you'll rather pack it into the back end system. What's the biggest mega trend that you're seeing that will fuel that vision, I mean, at the network level? Obviously, you know, some have said, hey, oh, the network's so fast, carrier grade, blah, blah, blah. I mean, obviously, wireless, cha wireless has changed in the past three, four years alone. Um, what is the biggest trend that you see that needs the most work to enable that kind of innovation with the consumption point? You know, I th there's two things that need to happen. One is, we have to learn to manage massive numbers of virtual machines, and to date, the largest installations aren't measured in millions. They're measured in thousands or tens or perhaps 100,000. Um, if this is going to go into kind of a mainstream deployment, we have to manage millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions. Nobody's built that data center yet. Second thing that has to happen is network bandwidth has to become far more sort of reliably available and latency has to drop wirelessly. Um, Wireline you know, we're already seeing in the States things like Fios and AT&T yeah. U-verse and things bringing in, you know, 10 to 25 megabits to the home. That's going to change everything once we get that rolled out ubiquitously across our market. There are markets already around the world, as I said, Singapore, Germany, others, where you've already got this. And it's changing how people are thinking about not only communication, but also about how they do compute. I mean, if you think about those two things you just mentioned, it really makes you think about how early this really is. And I talk to entrepreneurs all the time, and we're, Dave and I are both entrepreneurs, both run an analyst firm, we run a media company together. It's so early, and like, entrepreneurs 
they're at the ground floor of this. I mean, any advice for folks out there who are thinking about starting companies, whether it's a new programmer doing some cool stuff at, with apps to someone who's trying to re-architect a computer out there or networking, what's your advice to those entrepreneurs about, you know, are we that early? How early is it? Is it, is it purely embryonic? Are we at a good stage? Or what's your take on that and advice? Well, I, I think where we are right now is we're at sort of the elbow and the catalyzation curve for this stuff. We're not quite there yet. We're all waiting for the big lighthouse accounts to come on. We're waiting for sort of the first massive surge of adoption. Actually, this show is one of the things that you could use to convince yourself that we've actually hit the elbow. Yeah, it's, the it's feeling like it's getting there. It, it is. Yeah. It certainly yeah. is. And so I think we're, we're there. To an entrepreneur, I would tell them, what you really need to do is keep your eyes fixed on the end point. It's going to get there. You know, nobody could have predicted in 2008 that we'd go into a recession, and that slowed a lot of stuff down for a lot of us. Good companies figured out how to sell their ways through it. Great entrepreneurs figured out how to deliver services ahead of the market, and they're hanging on now waiting for it to happen. So, John, um, talk a little bit about uh, Pano uh, at the company. So you guys were founded in 2007. You've, you've had a long history. You mentioned Wise, and you also work for Ellison. Yes. Um, and, of course, th those of us who are old enough to remember, you know, Ellison in mid-'90s, Ellison and McNeely, very articulately talking about the thin client model and, you know, challenging Microsoft. And, you know, it's taken a little while, but we're kind of <laughs> finally there. Um, talk about the company, um, you know, where you're at. You obviously got some, some good backers. I mean, Goldman's a backer, Mayfield Foundation Capital. Um, give us a little background, the vital statistics, and share with our audience, you know, what you can. Sure. I, you know, as you said, the company was founded in 2007, really went to market in 2008, um, sort of right as the market was crashing. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up, as a business, deciding that we were going to sell product to those people who were buying, which meant that we sold mostly to the counter-cyclical verticals, like education, healthcare, and yeah. government, which is, I think, what you'd hear from everybody here, um, because, quite frankly, those were the verticals buying virtualization back then. Um, and financial services, right? Although back then, no. Um, right now, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that over the last year, what we've seen is the cyclicals coming up. So manufacturing, yeah. retail, um, et cetera. Financial and services. financial services is, thank God, finally investing again. <laughs> um, because, you know, in past sort of sea changes in technology, they led the uh, curve. Right. They were always the ones you waited for one of the big three or four to come up and say, we've embraced client server computing, or we've embraced, you know, the, you know sort of a, a certain network topology. In this case, this market change was led from the bottom because the people that were buying were actually the smaller guys, and they ended up with all of the experience about how to actually implement VDI. And that it has been fascinating to watch because now what happens is we talk to a Fortune 500 company, and they want to go talk to a small, you know, regional bank because they've been doing VDI for three years. And this just never happened. It, it always used to be exactly the other way around. And um, so we have, uh, the company's done, done very well. We sold, did, did well through the, uh, through the downturn. Uh, and we're now, we're doubling year on year. We'll probably do more than that. What's your head count? Uh, we're at about 70 people. 70? Nice. Yeah. And, and how, much, how much did you raise? The, the company in the last round raised $20 million, $20 million? Um, led by Mayfield. Mayfield. And yeah. you said Foundation was in the Foundation? Foundation was our first investor. And Goldman, and, too, And right? Goldman led the B round. Yep. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good... Well, I think you know, the consumption point is really good. I love the messaging of the consumption point. It kind of makes it, defines a new concept that's pretty consistent with what people do. Um, yeah, but the question I'm getting from some, fo some of the folks out there um, in the Twitter sphere is multimedia panel. Obviously, multimedia is great. Status, where is that at? How, how's that working? Um, multimedia, meaning rich media, like you know, videos and so on. All of it works great. We just put out, uh, there was just a report that came out from the Sorrel Group, uh, which looked at the display characteristics and user sort of experience of the Pano versus uh, some WISE devices versus a PC. And interestingly, we, uh, we beat the thin clients, and they found us to be on par um, with the PC in terms of experience. That included video, that included you know, Skype, that included webcams, that included all that stuff. The trick here, and the thing people can't imagine, is that it is possible to do 25 or 30 frames per second full screen video without a processor at the endpoint. They just can't believe it's possible to do, and all you have to do is go to our booth. <laughs> How does Intel feel? How, How does Intel feel about this? Um, <laughs> you know, well, quite frankly, the more panos that are sold, 
the more server uh, hardware they yeah. sell, the more infrastructure they sell. It's just pushing MIPS around. Yeah, and Dave, well, and Dave, in our research too, we talked to the Intel folks. We've been doing our own independent digging on, on the analysis. If you look at what Intel's done, their business on the cloud side is booming. Mm -hmm. They made a good call a few years ago to really double down on the cloud. So I totally agree with your point. It, on paper, you can say, oh, they must be pissed because no processor, but they're moving that growth in another sector. So right, what you're saying. and Servers I think and the cloud. advantage of the zero client here is that what it allows big companies to do is to shift customer spend from the endpoint back into the data center or cloud, exactly what you're saying. And when you do this, not only are you shifting low margin business for high margin business, you're shifting to a, a part of the stack where you get higher services attach rates. And so for companies like you know the larger system vendors, that's how they're measuring themselves today. Because yeah. they realize that hardware, all of us who have been in hardware know that over time everything commoditizes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and you're right too, the trend on the, you know, Dave and I are launching a new section called Services Angle and we talked to a lot of boutique consultancies and the big guys like CSC and you know, there's a lot of services changes and in innovation in the services business, but the consistent theme that we're hearing is you know, for desktop virtualization and at the edge, it's about reducing costs. That's it, and you know, and there's not a lot of services that people play in there. The services are dropping back at the cloud side, and and or the re-architecting side. So yeah, it's it's an element of the overall package, but not fundamental, but still key. And from a cost perspective, it's got to get down, but important for the end so, user. So John, talk about your your total available market and the use cases, right? Because you got to sure. be plugged in, right? Um, so that narrows, you know, some sectors. Right? But uh, where are the sweet spots? Well, right, yes, you have to be plugged in today. I mean, there are going to be products that will be released in the not too distant future, which will push that envelope. Right now, I would say, if you were to look at the overall enterprise market of connected devices, it's about 300 million PCs. Right. Of that 300 million PCs, the bottom 20%, 10 to 20%, are well served by uh, terminal services. They really are. These are disposable employees uh, that you put equipment in front of and you don't really care what the user experience is. Um, I know a lot about those because I used to you're sell saying, to those. You're <laughs> saying that's Wise's uh, market, essentially. It is, it is. And then there's the kind of the group of applications in the middle, which are really the office productivity applications. Yeah. And I would say that's probably you know, 70, 65, 70% 70 of the market. Um, and that's where we're targeting. So these are connected, you know, land-based um, desktops that are servicing sort of the, the general office worker. Then there's the upper 10% where they really need super high quality video. You're doing video editing or CAD yeah. CAM drawing where you just really need to have a supercomputer under your desk in order to make it work and work efficiently. Yeah. So we're going off after that middle. And as I said, if I were to sort of generalize where we are seeing the greatest traction right now, it would be around compliance. So HIPAA compliance, PCI compliance, SOX compliance, other things, where security ends up being a real big deal. Um, we're also seeing it around sort of places where it's difficult to administer. Um, so remote office sales, things like that, where people are very, very quickly figuring out that it's just too expensive to support PCs. Retail too? Uh, Re yeah, retail in retail, uh, absolutely. Well, they have to in retail because as you know, because of PCI requirements now, they can't yeah. keep credit cards local in the stores, which is basically what all those old point of sale devices <laughs> did. So they need something <laughs> Ideally like for retail, um, perfect. Exactly. This device is interesting because there's a little light on the top of it, it's not lit right now, but that button constitutes the only thing that support has to do, that light glows one of three colors. Yeah. It actually glows blue if everything's good, yellow if there's no VM attached, and red if there's no network. Our support guys basically have a, you know, it's, it's you know, what color's the light? Yeah. Uh, there is one other possibility, there's no light like it is now, and then they tell you to plug it in. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, it's, um, you That's know, good. it's, and for retail, for harsh environments, for anywhere where you don't, necessarily have the expertise on site to do a lot of yeah, yeah. Um, sort of management, these things are perfect. It's a big load off the IT guys. I mean, the old standard desktop, um, as we would call it, that middle ground, that 65%, that office productivity mm -hmm. kind of concept, you know, that's the old roll out the desktops and refresh the operating system. I mean, that's, you know, been a blocking and tackling. It's been a pain in the butt for IT, and it's a cost center for them. So, you know, IT guys don't like to roll out and service, you know, PCs like they used to. So I think, you know, clearly, that's an advantage to these guys. You know, got to have, they have management software, and they can look at a light, yep. and they can roll out software in the cloud. 
Well, they can move on a, to other things and develop applications. I think if you know our customers would tell you that simply the ability to only have to modify an image or an operating system or upgrade Flash or whatever at one place in the network is huge. Um, also, you know, not having to go there when it breaks and roll a truck or send a person is huge. How, how do you go to market? I mean, how do you go after those 200 million or so uh, current, how do you go to the fat middle? Is well, it? you know, the, the truth is it depends upon the size of the customer. Um, we are committed to selling exclusively through channels. So the question here is, what is the channel that you're going mm -hmm. to? Small, you know, sort of businesses, we go through resellers. Mid-size, we go through MSPs or system integrators. And at the very high end, we're using OEMs, like Fujitsu, who's a partner of ours, who's already embedded this technology in a range of devices. And they're taking it and rolling it out to their enterprise class customers. So, so. the Fujitsu I get, right, that's embedded. Right. Um, the others, there's a particular skill set you would think you would need because it's not just, you're not just shipping widgets, right? You're changing the mindset of, of the buyer, essentially, or maybe they're already bought in. But talk about that a little bit. Sure. I, I have yet to meet anyone who doesn't believe that ultimately the PC gets sucked into the network. The question is, what's left? And that's really what, that's what this whole thing is about. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to get rid of the PC. The problem is that the PC has a tremendous amount of inertia. So, and people are still um, worried about the risk associated with successful deployments of alternative technologies. So that's starting to change now. So I'll tell you, we see probably of the customers we talk to, there are a good 30 or 40 percent who have already decided before they talk to us that they're jettisoning the PC. That could be for one of a million reasons, but they've already said, we're not going to use PCs on the desktop anymore. We want to move it into the network. That's a pretty easy sale for us. It's the folks that say, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, or I think, you know, I'll try it, but I'm... Um, Proof of concept, so, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's what I, that sort of speaks exactly to what I talked about, the elbow of the catalyzation yeah. curve. So we're seeing the early adopters definitely in there and definitely in there in a big way. We haven't yet seen mainstream adoption. I would expect by this time, two years from now, um, you'll see a lot and, more. And, and there's enough desktop virtualization going on in there that you can leverage that infrastructure, is that right? Or is it still got to be more of a critical mass for you guys to get up well, there? Well, yeah, I think, I think it really comes down to uh, is there a critical mass in the kind of business that the customer is talking about? We have over 1,300 customers, and they're scattered all over the world. Uh, they're big and small. We have plenty of, you know, we can usually find you someone to talk to that's your size company. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that does give people a lot of comfort. Um, but what really gives them comfort is when we go in with a partner who knows how to make that successful. And interestingly, that group right now tends to be the managed service providers who have been doing desktop deployments for a long time and have figured out that desktop vir virtualization is simply a much more efficient way economically for them to do what they've been doing all along. So they're coming to us, and that's you know, that's a great feeling because it means that we've gotten something you right. You talk about big integrators, you talk about more local guys, uh, Well, I'm bars. talking about both. I mean, it can yeah. be anything from an MSP like a Fujitsu or an HP or someone who does mm -hmm. large-scale deployments, who takes on 100,000 desktops. To a regional or a local. Um, or it could be a telco. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised how many telcos have small business arms yeah, yeah. where they run the infrastructure. You guys um, are in Redwood City too, right? You're local. Right. Local we here. are. Okay, great. John, great to have you on theCUBE. We could spend another hour with you, but we got to get on schedule, but really appreciate the time spending with us inside theCUBE. Uh, great knowledge, great content. Thanks for sharing. Congratulations on all your success. We love the Pano. Uh, I'd love to get uh, one for our office because it looks cool. Great, coolest product I've seen. Love it, love the trend. Thanks John for coming Kish, on theCUBE. John Kish, CEO of Panologic. Thanks very much for coming on. Great, thanks very much.